Welcome to our last provocative lecture of the 2012-2013 year. It's been a lot of fun. I hope you are awake. I hope you are actively thinking. I hope you've had that monster drink because this speaker is going to challenge your mind at about 100 words per second. Um, he's going to make Hummel look slow, okay? <laughs> he's provocative. And the provocative lecture series is about provoking you to think. So don't just sit there and be agog at what he tells you. Ask questions. Why? Really? And what if? That's what we want for you to get out of our lecture series. I introduce to you, oh wait, one more before I bring you up. Uh, we are going to have a bar stool meeting at Flames. And this means that we have pizza, beer, and soda at Flames beginning at 7 o'clock right after this talk. And um, you're all welcome to come. So even if you don't know anybody, go and say hi, introduce yourselves, and you will know somebody. And talk about this talk and figure out what the heck was going on and uh, question it, everything else. It'll be a lot of fun. So you're welcome to join us for free pizza, beer, and sodas at the Flames, our bar still meeting. Make sure your cell phones are off. And then let me introduce Tim Timothy Sandifer, he is the principal attorney at the Pacific Legal Foundation. Um, Timothy has um, brought lawsuits to challenge the constitu constitutionality of laws in Oregon, Missouri, Nevada, and Kentucky that put constraints on the ability for people to earn a living. Imagine there are laws that keep you from earning a living. As principal attorney at the Pacific Legal Foundation, he's an, also an adjunct scholar with the Cato Institute. He's authored more than 40 scholarly articles. If you like what you see here, you can pick up one of his books, The Cornerstone of Liberty Property Rights in the 21st Century America, or The Right to Earn a Living, Economic Freedom of the Law. So I'd like to introduce you to Timothy Sandifer. That's right, I got my okay. own microphone. I forgot to mention that. Okay. All right. Well, uh, let me start out by saying I'm not an economist. Uh, I'm a lawyer. Okay, boo, right. Um, except that I sue the government for a living, which is uh, certainly the best job in the world. I would do it for free if I had to. Um, in fact, I do do it for free. I work for a nonprofit organization that represents people without charging them for our legal services. Um, Pacific Legal Foundation um, was organized in 1973 to defend individual rights, private property rights, economic freedom, limited government in the courts across this country. And if you'd like to learn more about our organization, and maybe some of you are interested in going into law school and you want to like to do public interest litigation where you're suing uh, for a cause instead of just for, for somebody's pocketbook. Um, I've left some brochures and materials outside on the table. You can learn more about what we do or check out our website, pacificlegal.org, or just uh, Google my name and you'll find us. Um, I'd like to talk about some cases that I've litigated recently, particularly a case that I've I, I litigated in Missouri uh, recently. Let me, let me show you this. This is, this is my client. This is my client, Michael Muni. He, uh, he runs a moving business in St. Louis called ABC Quality Movers. He's been in the moving business since he was 16 years old. And uh, his company is the top rated moving company on Angie's List in St. Louis. He has a federal license that allows him to move people from Missouri to other states so he could pack up your stuff in St. Louis and take you to you know, Miami if you wanted. Uh, and he has a state license that allows him to operate within the city of St. Louis. But he doesn't have a license to operate elsewhere in the state of Missouri. He's not allowed to operate in any other community in Missouri unless he first goes through the state's licensing law procedure. And in order to get a license in the state of Missouri to run a moving business, you first have to get permission from all of the existing moving businesses in the state. Uh, you might think that that's really stupid, and that is very stupid, 
But that is the law in most jurisdictions in this country. Most states and most municipalities in this country have laws like these on the books that require you to get permission from your own competitors before you're allowed to go into business as a mover, as a taxi cab company, as a limousine company. Uh, even hospitals are subjected to these kinds of laws. You can't open a hospital without permission from the existing hospitals and so forth. So we filed a lawsuit in the federal district court arguing that this law is unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. The 14th Amendment protects, among other things, your right to liberty, and it says that you cannot be deprived of liberty unless the government accords you due process of law. What is due process of law? Well, that's kind of a complicated question. The phrase due process of law traces back to the Magna Carta of 1215, which said that no person would be deprived of liberty except by the law of the land. And the, the idea is that you, cannot, you shouldn't be deprived of liberty arbitrarily, right? The diff, what we mean when we talk about law, when we talk about the rule of law instead of the rule of men, right? What we, what we mean by the rule of law is that government abides by certain general principles of public order that uses the government's coercive powers only in the service of the public good. Government doesn't rule just because it wants to. It doesn't take away your freedom or throw you in jail just because it feels like it. Right? I always say, if you've ever said to your kids something like, because I said so, that's why. Process of law clause of the 14th Amendment. Not really, because it's not state action, so that's okay. But if the government were ever to take away your freedom and say, because I say so, it really would be violating the due process of law clause of the 5th and the 14th Amendments. That's why we have that clause, to prevent the government from using its authority simply to benefit those who have more political power than you. There's an old Twilight Zone episode, maybe you've seen this, um, called It's a Good Life where the town is, go is ruled by this little 10-year-old boy who has si terrifying psychic powers. And if he doesn't like you, he can wish you off into the cornfield, which means he can just make you go away. Right? And he's killed the entire world, except for like 40 people who live in this town. It's a terrifying episode, right? because the whims of this child govern how everybody lives their lives. That is what the world is like in a society where there is no law, there's just the arbitrary power of the ruling authorities. Law means that the government will respect certain general principles that you can understand and that actually promote the public good instead of the private interests of those who wield the power. And based on those principles in the 17th century, English courts started protecting every English subject's right to earn a living at an ordinary occupation without having to get permission from, from some authority or something. Actually, these cases are even older than that. The oldest case I found on this issue is from 1385. But beginning in about Shakespeare's day, English courts started really ramping up protection for economic freedom of the subject. The most famous case is a case called the Case of the Monopolies. And what happened in that case was the government had issued a monopoly that allowed only one person to make and sell playing cards. Nobody else was allowed to make and sell playing cards. So somebody else went ahead and did so anyway. And there was a lawsuit about it. And it went up to the, to the English version of the Supreme Court. And the court said this was unconstitutional under the English Constitution. It violated the liberty of the subject and was not the law of the land because it was arbitrary and unreasonable. And based on that case, a series of decisions were issued by the English courts in the 17th century, led by one of my great heroes, Sir Edward Cook, the greatest lawyer in the history of the law. Uh, Sir Lord Cook was the Chief Justice of England under King James. He had been Attorney General for Queen Elizabeth. And in fact, there's a sculpture of him on the front door of the U.S. Supreme Court building. There's a story that there was a cabinet meeting with him and the king, and uh, the king said, the king's will is the law. And Lord Cook said, no, no, the law protects the king. And King James leapt to his feet and shouted, a traitorous speech. For if the judges may make of the laws what they please, they will soon make of them shipmen's hose. Shipmen's hoes are the stockings that sailors wear. And he, what he was saying was that if the judges can interpret the law, then the laws will develop runs in them like old stockings. And, uh, and that confrontation is sculpted on the front of the Supreme Court building. Well, because Lord Cook dared to challenge King James's illegal activities, he was eventually fired 
as Chief Justice of England, which is why today the U.S. Constitution prohibits the president from firing judges because of that incident. So Lord Cook is a great hero, and one of the big issues that he cared a lot about was getting rid of these royal monopolies. He said they're unconstitutional and they deprive people of the economic opportunity that they need. And my favorite of his decisions as a judge is a case called the Case of the Upholsterers. It was illegal to practice the trade of upholstery without permission from the upholsterer's guild. And so this guy wanted to go into upholstery, and he was brought up on charges for this, and it went up to the court of King's Bench, and Lord Cook said, uh, why is this law, why is there a law that says you can't practice upholstery without a license? And what did the upholsterer's guild say? Did they say, well, this law exists to, to make upholstery more scarce so that we can charge more and screw the consumer? No, of course they didn't, right? They said, well, this law protects the public from bad upholstery, I guess, right? You go in there and why that chair is just atrocious. <laughs> They're English, so they talk that way, right? And well, Lord Cook was having none of it. He said, he said no skill there is in this for a man might learn it in six hours. And then in one of my favorite lines from any court decision, he said, unskillfulness is sufficient punishment. Right? Unskillfulness is punishment enough. If you're bad at your job, nobody's going to buy from you, so there's no reason for the government to get involved. If you're defrauding people, sure. If you're harming people, yeah, okay. But if you're just bad at your job, that's punishment enough. There's no reason for the government to be making sure that people are qualified and so forth. And so that decision and a bunch of other similar decisions throughout the 17th century formed the basis of what, we, what lawyers call the Whig anti-monopoly tradition, the idea that everybody has this right to earn a living at an at a occupation of their choice without government interference. And when Lord Cook retired from, from law, he wrote a textbook called The Institutes. And Cook's Institutes were the law book that you would read when you were a law student in the 18th century. And I'm talking about law students like Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, James Madison didn't become a lawyer, but he studied Cook. Um, the, the, the founding fathers all read Cook, and in his books he says over and over again, you have the right to earn a living without unreasonable government interference. In fact, this, this idea appears repeatedly in the founding fathers' writings. They called it the right to pursue happiness. But in the summary view of the rights of British America, which was the pamphlet that Thomas Jefferson wrote that got him the job of writing the Declaration of Independence, in the summary view, Jefferson, for one of the things he complains about about the British, he says, he says the problem is, one of the problems is it's illegal to make things out of iron in the colonies. What you had to take iron and ship it to England to be made into things and then brought back to America. Why would they do that? Why would they have a law that made it illegal to make things out of iron in the colonies? To protect jobs, right? To protect the jobs of English ironmongers. We don't want to have competition. We have to protect jobs. So, in other words, Americans had to pay more for the products that they needed. And American entrepreneurs who might have made a living making things out of iron are pro legally prohibited from doing so. And how is that fair? Right? And so one of the reasons for the American Revolution was the idea of economic liberty. Well, flash forward to the, to, to the end of the Civil War and the Constitution is amended to add the 14th Amendment to the Constitution that says government, that states, as well as the federal government, may not deprive you of liberty without due process of law. And one of the rights that that protects, the authors of the amendment said over and over again, one of the rights it protects is the right to earn a living without unreasonable government interference. A right that liberal Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas called the most precious liberty that man possesses. But around the end of the Civil War particularly, I mean, this had been around for a long time, and been, like I said, it was around the 17th century, but especially beginning after the Civil War, you have the rise of what are called occupational licensing laws. These are laws that restrict your ability to go into a business unless you first prove to the government that you're qualified. And the first case, the first Supreme Court case to address the constitutionality of these laws was this case, Dent versus West Virginia in 1889, which was written by my hero, my favorite Supreme Court justice of all time, Stephen J. Field. Stephen Field was an amazing man. He was the first Californian on the Supreme Court. He was the longest sitting Supreme Court justice in history until Justice Douglas came along. He was a 49er, and he was the only Supreme Court justice ever arrested for murder. And... <laughs> Um, he didn't do it. He didn't do it. His bodyguard did it. Um, 
tell you that story in the question and answer session if you want more. But anyway, uh, Justice Field was one of the godfathers of this idea that the Constitution protects your right to engage in a business or a trade without unreasonable government interference. And so it's kind of ironic that he wrote this decision, Dent, which was the first Supreme Court case on this issue, and he upheld the constitutionality of occupational licensing laws. The case involved medical licensing. It was a law that said you had to prove that you were qualified as a doctor before you could be a doctor. And Justice Field said it is undoubtedly the right of every citizen to follow any lawful calling, business, or profession he may choose. This right is a distinguishing feature of our Republican institutions. But the state may prescribe regulations that will secure people against the consequences of ignorance and incapacity, as well as deception or fraud. As long as these laws are appropriate to the profession and and the, what they require you to learn is related to the business and is attainable by reasonable study and application, no objection to their validity can be raised. But when these laws have no such relation or require training that is not attainable by reasonable study and application, then they operate to deprive a person of his right to pursue a lawful vocation. That's the standard to this day in theory. Unfortunately, Beginning in about 1934, the Supreme Court of the United States started backing away from providing protections for economic freedom in this country. Under a theory that lawyers call the rational basis test, government is allowed to deprive you of your private property or your economic freedom virtually without limit. What happened in 1934 was the Supreme Court said, you know, from now on, the government can regulate the economy in practically any way that it wants to. And the Supreme Court has only slightly backed away from that since then, so that today, when the government decides to take away your private property or your right to earn a living, it can pretty much get away with it every time. You, all, you might remember the Kelo versus New London eminent domain case from 2005, right? That was a case of the rational basis test. The rational basis test is so loose that the government wins practically every time. And the reason is because the courts say, as long as the judge thinks that a politician might have thought the law was a good idea, it's constitutional. In fact, under the rational basis test, the plaintiff is required to, quote, disprove every conceivable basis for the law, end quote, in order to win. Now you're thinking, wait a minute, you can't prove a negative. That's right, you can't prove a negative. That's right. Um, so that's, that's the situation entrepreneurs are in today. However, this case is supposedly still good law. And in fact, in 1957, the Supreme Court issued a case called Schwer, in which they said again, that occupational licensing laws have to be related to what the person is doing and have to test that person's ability or, or capacity in some way. They can't just be used to prohibit competition. They can't just be used to protect people who have licenses against fair competition from people who don't. So how do we get to a situation where my client, Michael Muni, is basically required to get permission from the existing moving companies before he can go into business as a mover? Well, this is the law right here. Missouri Revised Statute 390.051 that says if you want to run a moving business, you first have to get a government license called a certificate. And these are the things you have to do to get a license. First, you have to file your application. And then the government decides whether you are fit, willing, and able to practice the trade of moving. And what fit, willing, and able means is whether you're safe, you're, whether you're insured, whether you are a drunk driver, uh, you know, whether you're a crook, that sort of thing. Makes sense. Then you have to prove that the service proposed will serve a useful present or future public purpose. Anybody in here care to guess what that means? You might as well, because nobody knows what that means. <laughs> Nobody knows what that means. That phrase appears nowhere else in any law in the United States. Not in any other state, not in Missouri. It's not defined in any case. There's no regulation. Nothing defines what this phrase means. Nobody knows what that phrase means. Then, after you've proven this unprovable thing, the government will notify all the existing moving companies and give them the opportunity to object. And when they object, you are required to go to a hearing where you are required to prove not only these things, but also that giving you a license would be consistent with the public convenience and necessity. Does anybody care to de define what that phrase means? Yeah, exactly. Nobody knows what that phrase means either. However, we do know that if an objection is filed, and of course it's going to be, right? 
uh, if an objection is filed, then the government must consider the diversion of revenue or traffic from existing carriers when deciding whether to grant a license or not. So this law grants a privilege to existing companies regardless of their qualifications, without any regard for whether they're good at their job or not. This law gives protectionism, protects against fair competition, existing moving companies for no other reason than the fact that they already exist. That's the law. And here's the regulation that implements the law. It explains that when an application is filed, the government puts a notice of that in its newsletter, which it sends to all the existing moving companies, and they're allowed to object. And when they object, you have to go to this hearing, like I said. Well, at the hearing, guess what? You're required to hire a lawyer. If your business, if your small company is organized as a corporation, as many of them are, you're required to hire a lawyer to go to this administrative hearing, which is a very expensive proposition for most small businessmen who don't have a lot of startup capital for their company, right? That's why they started a moving company. If they had a lot of startup capital, they would have gone into some other business, right? So as I said, there's a three-step process for a, for a license or a moving company. You have to prove you're fit, willing, and able. That's public safety stuff. Nobody has any problem with that. Then you, well, some libertarians like myself do have a problem with that, but we'll talk about that some other day. So the fit, willing, able, public safety stuff. Then you have to prove that you would serve a useful present or future public purpose. And then the government notifies the existing companies and gives them the chance to intervene. That's what they call the objections. Intervene. And then you have to prove that you would be consistent with the public convenience and necessity, whatever that means. This, is, this kind of law is called a Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity Law. And it differs from an occupational licensing law, like the medical licensing or the, or the law licensing that I've, you know, I'm a member of a cartel. You know, I've got a law license to make it illegal for you to, pra to compete against me, right? Um, these laws differ from occupational licensing laws in that they have no relationship to whether a person is practiced or skilled or experienced or anything. They exist solely to prevent competition. Why would these laws exist to prevent competition? Well, these laws were invented in about the 1880s, and they were intended primarily to regulate railroads or other public utility companies. And the idea, there were a couple reasons for, for these kinds of laws. One of them was, at the time, in the, between the 1880s and the 1930s, there was a fashionable economic theory that competition was a bad thing. Competition is wasteful and inefficient and destructive. And the reason why is because, well, for instance, let's say a railroad. You have a railroad between Sacramento and San Francisco, and then somebody else comes along and starts a second railroad between Sacramento and San Francisco. Well, we don't need two railroads. We just need one railroad. So it's just wasteful for them to open up a second railroad, right? That was the theory. Um, so these laws would bar excessive or destructive competition. Another reason for these laws was to prevent what's called cream skimming. Cream skimming is the idea that one business is required by law to engage in some sort of inefficient behavior. And then another company comes along and says, we can do the job better by not doing that inefficient behavior. Well, then they're cream skimming, which is supposedly unfair. Uh, this, have you, anybody in here heard of Uber? Right? This, you know there's lawsuits going on right now about whether Uber is legal or not because some, a lot of taxi companies in a, in a lot of cities are arguing that Uber is running an unlicensed taxi cab business. And one of their complaints is that it allows cream skimming because taxi cab companies are legally prohibited from turning away customers. Whereas Uber allows the drivers to choose whom they want to drive and don't want to drive to various places. So this is the cream skimming rationale. Another rationale for these laws was protecting public, private investments in public utilities. Back in the day, public utilities were often operated by uh, private industry. For instance, the streetcar. Right? In Who Framed Roger Rabbit, am I dating myself by citing that movie? You know the, you know the movie? Okay. In Who Framed Roger Rabbit, right, the streetcar monopoly is run by Cloverleaf. Right? Cloverleaf is a private company, and they're run for private profit, but they have this special government license to operate the monopoly on streetcars in the city. And the idea was, well, we need to encourage investment of this sort, so we're going to, like, it's like a patent, we're going to prohibit competition against these streetcar companies. Since the progressive era, of course, many of these formerly privately run utilities are now run by the government. The government just directly operates these utilities now. So a lot of these arguments are kind of outdated, and yet they, these laws stay on the books. Another rationale that you often hear for these certificate of necessity laws is that it gathers knowledge from industry professionals. What that means is 
Tim wants to start a moving company, but the government doesn't know much about Tim, so what they'll do is they'll ask any other movers, because they all know Tim, and they'll say, you know, hey, do you know him about this guy? Is he qualified or not? And then they go, say, oh, yeah, he's great. He's, you know, he's wonderful. And then they're like, okay, get license granted, right? So this is the idea of gathering knowledge from industry professionals is why we allow this objection procedure to go on. And then finally, some people argue that these laws protect against environmental damage or other perceived externalities. The problem with the first two theories about wasteful or destructive competition is that it's poppycock. It turns out competition is actually a good thing. And that was really established in large part by this economist, Friedrich Hayek, who pointed out not only that the government cannot possibly acquire the information necessary to run an efficient company, because nobody knows this information, but that the free market is the discovery process by which we discover what is and is not an efficient operation. The reason we need competing railroad lines between San Francisco and Los Angeles is because nobody really knows what would be the ideal railroad line. There probably is no ideal railroad line. So by having the two companies compete, consumers get to decide for themselves which one they want to, to uh, uh, use. And then these companies can decide, can discover what it is that consumers want. Maybe consumers want completely opposite different things. In fact, they probably do because consumers are crazy. Right? But, the, but competition allows the businesses to, to, to tailor their services as best as possible to these crazy consumers. Only the market can discover what is wasteful or efficient, and it can only do so by free competition. So the idea that a government entity can decide what kind of business is necessary is absurd. It really is absurd. If you think about it, for one thing, they have no, no incentive to get it right, right. A bureaucratic entity that has to decide what kind of business is necessary they, as is all things with the government, they get paid even if they get it wrong. That's the most important thing you can ever know about government. They get paid even when they get it wrong. Right? Between here and my home in El Dorado County, California, about a three-hour drive, there are probably a hundred Taco Bells between here and my house. And I can stop at any one of them and buy a yummy, yummy chicken burrito for a buck 29, 99 cents at some places. Right? And it's a good burrito. I know I've eaten thousands of them. <laughs> They've never made me sick. They're, they're nummy, they're scrumptious, and they're pretty nutritious. I mean, they're probably bad for me, but they're still good, right? They're exactly what I want. And it's at two in the freaking morning. For a buck twenty-nine, I've never seen. And they'll take credit cards. They trust me with my credit card at two in the morning to give me a burrito. Why? Why? Because if I don't like it, I can go to Del Taco. That's it. That's the only reason, right? If the government ran the taco stands so that they were paid with tax dollars, even if they closed before two in the morning they wouldn't stay open till 2 in the morning, right? The reason why we get efficient service from free market entities and not from government entities is because free market entities get paid only if they do it the right way. And they can be punished if they do it the wrong way, where the government really can't. This economist, Joseph Schumpeter, also pointed out that the, the, the whole process of free competition is a process of what he called creative destruction. And what that means is, yeah, sometimes people lose their jobs. Sometimes big businesses go out of business. The, not long ago, I was trying to remember all the big names in stores and companies that I could think of that are no longer in business. And probably none of you remember any of these, but some of you might. Gemco. Anybody remember Gemco? Fedmart. The Federated Group. Right? These companies that at one time seemed, you know, insurmountable, and as far as market share is concerned, are now no longer even heard of, right? McDonald's posted its first quarter loss ever last year, I believe it was. Right? Why? Because creative destruction is the dynamic process by which the market discovers what we want and gives it to us, or if it doesn't give it to us, gives us the opportunity to give it to ourselves, right? So the idea of barring excessive or destructive competition is poppycock. Cream skimming. The problem with the cream skimming theory is that a lot of the time what's characterized as cream skimming is simply proof that the industry is becoming more competitive, like with Uber, right? 
What, what's going on is people, technological change, new discoveries in how to run businesses are finding new, more efficient methods of doing business. And as a result, the old regulations are, are, are falling out of, of applicability, right? They're getting obsolete. Laws don't change nearly as fast as anything else. Right? I always say there's a reason why they sell ties at the U.S. Supreme Court gift shop that have little pictures of turtles on them. Right? The law is very slow. Shakespeare says laws delay in Hamlet. Right? So a lot of the time what's characterized as cream skimming is simply the discovery of more efficient ways of doing business, which the government then prohibits. The idea that these laws prevent environmental damage or other externalities is silly. Alternative methods are better. For example, punishing people for environmental damage, which these certificate laws don't, right? You can, the, the law, as I showed you, the Missouri law, will prevent you from competing against an existing company, even if the existing company is a terrible polluter and you're a very clean operation. And the idea of gathering knowledge from industry professionals ignores the obvious conflict of interest that if I'm asked, whoa, would Joe be a good competitor against you? Well, no, that guy's, that guy's slime, you know. Of course I'm going to say that. Although not always. I'm doing a case right now challenging the constitutionality of Kentucky's mover law. And we just got some documents from the government last week. And I was looking through them yesterday. One was very interesting. It's a decision from an administrative judge denying a person a license to run a moving company, even though he had been in the business for 35 years, on the grounds that he would compete against existing moving companies. And that's it. And one of the notes the judge makes is that the people who objected against them, they were asked, well, do you think he's qualified? And they said, quote, he would be a great mover, end quote. Nevertheless, denied a license because he would compete against existing moving companies. How these certificate of necessity laws actually work is much more easily explained by the theory economists call public choice theory, which was pioneered by James Buchanan and Gordon Tullock in their book, The Calculus of Consent. And public choice theory, I'm hoping everybody, you all heard of public choice theory, right? All right, excellent. So public choice says that in the legislative business, there are winners and losers, and the winners are going to game the system as best they can to profit from that system at the expense of those who are not so well politically connected. Right? Interest group activity is a direct function of the profits to be expected from the political process. A lot of the time, you know, in the news and stuff, people say, oh, the evil private interests, or the candidates, I'm going to go fight the private interests. Right? Well, the private interests exist because of the system. Private interest groups aren't some sort of signal that people are bad or nasty. They're created by the system. That's this, if a system redistributes wealth and opportunity, people are going to try to exploit that system for their own benefit. So here is an application. In fact, this is my client's application for a moving license in Missouri. It's called an MO1 form, and you see he's got his information up here. You know, and here was his big mistake. He asked to operate within 125 miles of St. Louis, Missouri. And as a result... The government published the notice register, published the information. The applicant has applied for a license to operate within 125 miles radius of St. Louis. And he received four objections, I think it was four, from existing moving companies. Here's what these objections look like. Now, I provided a, one from a different case just because it was easier for me to put the PowerPoint together, but they all looked exactly the same. Here's what an objection looks like. Motion to intervene by an existing moving company. Comes now the intervener, and he objects. And here's his reasons for objecting to there being any new moving company in the state of Missouri. Right there, that's the only one. A grant of authority sought in the instant application would permit substantial diversion of traffic from our motor carrier operation. That's it. Nothing in there about public health, safety, welfare, or anything. Simply because he would compete against existing moving companies. This guy here, this, this one's from a case called Another Smooth Move. I went to visit him. He's located in Salem, Missouri. Anybody here ever been to Salem, Missouri? I didn't think so. Um, it's in the middle of freaking nowhere. <laughs> and he asked for opera to operate within 75 mile radius of Salem, Missouri. And this happened. And that meant that he had to go to a hearing. And at a hearing, he had to hire a licensed attorney in order to represent him, which, as I said, is a very time consuming and expensive process. And once you hire the attorney, then you have to go through the whole procedure. Now, I said you have to prove that you would serve a public, useful, present, future, public purpose, whatever it is, right? And nobody knows what that means. Not only does nobody know what that means, and not only did no regulation define what that meant, 
But the Missouri Department of Transportation, MoDOT, kind of invented it themselves, what, how to solve this problem. What they did was they came up with this thing, which is not authorized by the law in any way. They just invented this themselves. It's called a statement of support. And what they would do is they would give this to the person who applied for the license and say, go f have your clients, your prospective clients, have them go fill this out and turn it into us. And this statement proves that your service would provide, that you would provide a useful president of public service. Now, here's what it looks like. It says, ABC is a great and affordable company. They help us out when donors donate items to our children's charity. That's it. And as you can see, it's not sworn. It's not notarized. It doesn't state any objective facts. This isn't admissible evidence of any sort. And I said in deposition, I said to the government's uh, employees, I said, so now when you get one of these things, do you like investigate them for whether they're telling the truth? No. Is there any particular number of these things that you're required to get in order to prove a useful future or present public purpose? No. Just, you know, fill them out. You could have your aunt fill out six copies and turn it in and be okay, right? So once you file your application and you file your notice claims of support and you get and it gets published and you get an objection, now you have to go through a hearing. Most people couldn't afford the time and expense of going through the hearing. And so what they ended up doing was withdrawing their applications. In fact, between 2005 and 2011, there had been 76 applications for new moving company licenses in the state of Missouri. Of those 76, only 15 asked for statewide authority. The rest asked to operate a moving company in a small rural area like 50 miles of Salem, Missouri, or in a city like St. Louis, which was exempt from the objection procedure. Right? That's what they asked for. Only 15 asked for authority to operate statewide, and of those 15, all of them were subjected to objections by existing moving companies. I may have the math wrong. I think it was 17, actually, not 15. So 17 filed applications for moving companies throughout the state of Missouri and were subjected to objections by existing firms that, as I said, only stated competition as the reason for objecting. A total of 106 of these objections in that, time, in that six year period, not a single one ever so much as alleged that a new moving company would be damaging to the public. So as I said, most people withdrew their applications, 50 of them withdrew their applications and said, okay, we won't ask for statewide authority. We will only ask for authority in a small area. And then all the objections were withdrawn and they got their licenses. Does that sound like something that protects the public safety? I mean, if it's, this law was designed to protect the public safety, it wouldn't matter where the person's moving. You would still say he's not safe. No. What happened was if you asked for an area where you wouldn't compete against anybody, then the objections went away, except for two. Two guys, and this is one of them. Daryl Gaines of Columbia, Missouri. He said he wanted to go all the way through the hearing process. He wanted a statewide moving license, so he went through the whole process. He hired a lawyer, he went to the hearing in front of the Administrative Hearing Committee, and here's the decision by the Administrative Hearing Commission, which said, Gaines is in compliance with applicable safety and insurance requirements. However, interveners showed that they already reliably provide statewide common carrier household goods services. Gaines' proposed service would merely duplicate their service. Interveners showed that they already covered the market sufficiently and more competition would divert traffic and revenue from them. Therefore, denied. So here's an applicant who is fully qualified, has all the safety and insurance requirements, who is denied a license solely because he would compete with existing companies. You might think that's pretty outrageous, and you'd be right. Until you found All Metro Movers, the other company that decided to go through the whole hearing process only a few years later. They got a decision from the administrative committee that says the applicant is in compliance with the safety and insurance requirements, and the evidence is enough to show a benefit to the public from increased competition. Possible benefits could be expected from increased competition. In this case, there may be a benefit from competition, therefore granted. Two moving companies with identical facts get completely opposite decisions under this law. That's what you would call arbitrary, right? Now, this is my breakdown. It was 70, 17 that required statewide authority, and 59 only requested authority within a small area or a commercial zone. And as I said, commercial zones were exempt from the law, so you could operate a moving company in St. Louis without having to go through this process. But of these 17, all of them were subjected to objections. In the period that we studied, we could find only one company that had gone through the hearing and actually gotten its license. That was, that was the, the one I just showed you. 
Now, we're talking about people who operate moving companies. These aren't rich guys, right? These aren't giant corporate behemoths who are evil because they're rich, like, like we're told, you know. Because it used to be the monopoly meant a, a, a company that made it illegal to compete with you. Now it means a successful company, right? Um, and so this, we're not talking about evil, greedy, rich people. We're talking about nice, greedy, not rich people, right? People who want to make a living for themselves and their families without government coming in and choosing winners or losers in the economy and dictating who can and cannot operate a business. Now, this issue of whether the government can use its licensing laws simply to protect established insiders from legitimate competition is a question that is currently causing a lot of conflict in the federal courts of appeal. In 2003, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals decided a case called Craig Miles. What happened in Craig Miles was you had to have a license, this is said in Tennessee. In Tennessee, you had to have a license to sell coffins. And in order to sell coffins, you first had to be a licensed funeral director. Even though you weren't officiating at funerals, you had to have this license. And to get a license, you had to spend two years in training, learning how to embalm bodies and grief counseling and all this sort of thing simply in order to sell a box. The Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals struck down that law and said this law exists for no public purpose but simply to protect established businesses against legitimate competition from newcomers. Unfortunately, almost the same week that that decision came out, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals issued another decision. In that case, called Powers versus Harris, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals said government may use its licensing laws solely for the purpose of protecting established businesses against fair competition, even if the government admits that the law has no protection has no relationship at all to public health or safety or welfare, the government can choose to give a benefit to some people simply because it wants to. The Supreme Court has refused to take up this issue. Only a few weeks ago, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals decided a case on this issue, another one of these coffin cases, in which it also said government may not use its licensing laws simply to protect established businesses. And in 2008, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals said the same thing. And this case is kind of dear to my heart because... It was my case, and I won it. In the Ninth Circuit case, what happened was my client, Alan Merrifield, he ran a, uh, a pest control business. And his pest control business, he didn't use pesticides. He didn't believe in pesticides. He thought they're dangerous. They're, they pollute the, 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 the environment. They're really not very good for what he wanted to do. So he didn't use pesticides. Instead, he used nets or screens, or spikes. You've seen these spikes on buildings to keep pigeons from landing on them, right? That's what he did. He installed spikes on buildings to keep birds from landing on there. Well, in California, if you want to run a business putting spikes on a building to keep birds away, you first have to get a Branch 2 Structural Pest Control Operator's License. And to get a license, you have to spend two years in training learning how to use, store, and handle pesticides. And then you have to take and pass a 200-question multiple-choice exam on the use, storage, and handling of pesticides. Now, I have read this exam, and I'm under a court order not to disclose to you what's on that exam, in case any of you want to run out and be pest control technicians. But I can tell you what's not on that test. There's not a single question on there about pigeons, and there's not a single question on there about spikes. And it gets better, because the law only applies if you're dealing with pigeons, if you put the same spikes on the same building to keep seagulls away, you don't need any license at all. <laughs> really? Business and Professions Code Section 8555G specified pigeons, rats, and mice as the only pests to whom the law, I mean, the, the dealer, people who dealt with them had to get this license. Otherwise, you didn't need a license. So we sued, and we said, the Pacific Legal Foundation, we filed a lawsuit, and we said, this law is irrational. It violates this person's right to earn a living. And even though the government gets away with a lot of stuff they shouldn't get away with when it comes to regulating businesses, they shouldn't be allowed to do something this irrational. Because the rational basis test says the government can only regulate businesses if it does so in a way that is rational. Well, so we filed a lawsuit, and the government offers up its expert witness for deposition. Now, this is the guy who basically wrote the law. That's going to be a very interesting deposition. So I go to the deposition, and I'm asking him questions, and I said to him, this law requires two years of training to put spikes on a building to keep pigeons away. He said, yes, that's right. I said, but no training at all to put the same spikes in the same building to keep seagulls away. He said, yeah, that's right. 
I said, would you call this irrational? He said, yes, I would. <laughs> and the government's lawyer says, um, <clears throat> can we take a break? <laughs> So we come back from the break, and the witness says, I'd, uh, I'd like to clarify what I said about irrational. <laughs> I'm like, I bet you would, right? And he says, what I mean is, from a public's perspective, it might be irrational, but here's what happened. Originally, you needed a license for all pest control work. And then they were saying, well, if you aren't dealing with pesticides, you're not a danger to the public, so why don't we just get rid of the licensing requirement for those people? And those of us who already had licenses, we didn't want to face competition against newcomers. So we went to the legislature and we said, can you divide up the market and let us keep the pigeons, the rats, and the mice? Because those are the most common pests. And those guys can deal with all the others. <laughs> and I was like, tell me more. <laughs> I used to tell law students the hardest part about a depot like that is not going, ah, I got you! <laughs> to say, I see. <laughs> so we went to the court and I said, Your Honor, it is an undisputed fact in this case that this law is positively irrational. And we lost. We lost because the law is so tilted against business owners under this rational basis test that the court presumes the law to be constitutional until I prove otherwise, and not just prove otherwise. The court can invent its own justification for the law, even if it has nothing to do with the evidence, and that is enough to uphold the law under the rational basis test. So what happened was the court said, well, it's true, you know, there's no evidence here that this law does anybody any good, but I can think of a reason that they might have passed this law, therefore constitutional. Now imagine that that were the standard in criminal law. Imagine that you're arrested for murder, and you go in front of the judge, and the judge says, well, the prosecution didn't prove its case, but I can think of a way you might have done it, therefore guilty. That really is the standard that is applied to business owners and property owners in this country when they go to court to defend their right to earn a living, a right that was cherished at the common law for four centuries, a right that is deeply embedded in this nation's history and tradition, a right we used to call the American dream, a right that is central to the lives of immigrants, of the poor, of members of minority groups who don't have the kind of political influence to get the government to do their bidding the way this expert witness was able to influence the legislature to do what he wanted, right? People like that, people like my clients, don't have that kind of political influence. Therefore, they can't afford, they don't have the time and money to go down to the legislature or the city council or whatever and say every day, please respect my right to earn a living. Please respect my right to earn a living. They don't have that time. They're out there busy trying to lead lives. Therefore, instead, what they have to do is rely on the Constitution for protection. That's why, they that's why we have the Constitution, is to protect us against the government so that we don't have to go and be involved in politics all the time. You, especially young people, are constantly being harassed. You should be more concerned about politics. You should care about politics. Rock the vote, blah, blah, blah. The whole reason we have a Constitution is so you don't have to do that boring crap. The reason we have a constitution is so that you can instead spend your time studying or running a business or meeting somebody to, that you want to marry and raise a family with or going on vacation, stuff like that. That's why you have a constitution, so you don't have to be obsessed with politics all the time. I hate politics because I went to junior high school. Right? <laughs> junior high school is just <laughs> politics, constant <laughs> politics. Who's popular and for what completely irrational reason? Who's going to be unpopular next week for some completely even more irrational reason, right? That's politics. Law, the reason we have law is to create a boundary around politics that protects your rights from politics. Some years ago, my parents went on a cruise to South America. And I don't remember what country it was. I wish I could, but one of the countries they went to, they were told that their tour guide said, you know, see these houses are all painted these funny colors. And he said, the reason why is because when somebody runs for president, the, per the candidate chooses a color, blue or red or green, and you then paint your house that color of the candidate you're supporting. And if your guy wins, they can identify you and give you rewards. And if your guy loses, then the people who win can single you out and punish you, right? <laughs> The reason we don't have that in the United States is because our rights are protected against politics by the shield of the Constitution that says, you and I can argue over who should be dog catcher or who should be president, and then they have the election and my guy loses and I go back to my house and I'm still okay. I still have my house. I don't have to ask permission. 
Right? The, difference, the, the fundamental difference is the difference between a right and a permission. And this should be very important to you because all of you, until very recently, didn't have any rights. You only had permissions. You had to ask permission for everything that you did. Maybe some of you still have to do this. Right? But what, you're, what you now have are rights. You can choose to do things because you want to, and nobody can stop you. Unfortunately, our intellectual leaders today are increasingly trying to persuade you that rights are permissions, that government gets to decide who has rights and who doesn't have rights and can revoke those for the government's own purposes, not for your interests, that rights don't exist to protect your right to pursue happiness, that rights exist as privileges given to you by the government for the government's own purposes. This is an extremely dangerous and awful idea, and you should never allow yourself to accept it. Rights are not privileges that are given to you by the state they are not permissions that society grants to you for society's betterment. Rights are those freedoms that you are born with because you are a human being. And I love freedom. I love my freedom. Sometimes I take out my freedom and I just fondle it. <laughs> I do. I take out my freedom and I'm like, wow, that's really cool. I've got this freedom. Right? I can drive, I, just last week I was driving through Pennsylvania and it occurred to me, wow, I can go anywhere I want. Nobody can tell me that, that I can't. I can do what I want. I love that feeling. Sadly, that freedom is getting smaller and smaller every day. A couple days ago, the TSA confiscated my wife's peanut butter at the airport. <laughs> she was bringing peanut butter to me. And this is great peanut butter, by the way. You should get, look this up on the internet. It's from Hawaii. It's peanut butter with coconut in it. Oh, this jar is like 10,000 calories. This is good stuff, right? <laughs> so she went on the TSA's website to see whether Uncle Sam would let her carry her peanut butter on the plane because, you know, that's what killed all those people on September 11th was all the peanut butter. So she goes on the website, and it says on there, you can bring peanut butter on the plane. So she goes to the security checkpoint, and they took out her peanut butter, and, they, and she said, wait, I thought I'd check the list. I'm allowed to bring peanut butter. Not with coconut in it. <laughs> took away your coconut. You cannot travel with coconut on an airplane in the United States of America. It is a political question in the United States whether you should be allowed to carry peanut butter on an airplane. The reason we have a constitution is so that things do, be, do not become political questions like this. A free society is a society where you don't have to care about politics. But it is now a political question whether you, whether you can bring peanut butter on a plane or whether you can drink a large big gulp in New York City. That is the direction we are headed. And you and you alone are the people who can change that. And the way you can change that is by returning to the idea that freedom is a right and not a privilege that the government gives to you whenever it decides that it's okay for society. My client, Michael Muni, has the right to run a business without getting permission from the government. When he has to get permission from the government, you have these rent-seeking dynamics caused by the public choice problem where businesses, established businesses, spend their time and money policing the licensing laws and preventing competition instead of what they ought to be doing, improving their service and lowering their prices, right? And the result is bad for consumers because you don't get the moving services that you need and the prices are too high and it's bad for our entrepreneurs who are denied the opportunity to earn a living that should be theirs by right. Now, I'm glad to say that we filed our lawsuit, and we were suing, and we were having a great time, and we argued the case in front of the court, and after we argued the case in front of the court, the legislature backed down and repealed the Missouri Mover Law and replaced it with what is, I believe, one of the most pro-competitive licensing laws in the country that says that now all you have to do is prove that you're qualified and safe in order to run a moving business in Missouri. That was in August of last year, and since that time... Since August of last year, we don't really have many statistics yet, but the Depart Missouri Department of Transportation just released this report a few, months, a few weeks ago, and what they said is that the average wait time for a, a mover license in Missouri has now dropped from 154 days to 19 days. One poor schmuck had to wait 1,119 days for a license to run a moving company. That's three years. What entrepreneur can wait three years to get a license to run his business? 
It ought to be so easy to run a moving company in this country. You ought to be able to get a truck and paint the word mover on the side of it and run a moving company. It should be that simple. But because of the government getting involved and saying what is a right and what is our privilege and who can go into business and all this sort of thing, you know, all for the public safety, of course, the result is that only those who are lucky enough to already be licensed are allowed to earn a living. And they are using these laws, exploiting the consumer and exploiting the entrepreneur as a result. Now, since that law was repealed, we've filed new lawsuits in Nevada and in Kentucky challenging those states' laws. As I said, these kinds of laws exist on the books in most jurisdictions, and not just for moving companies or taxi companies, but even for hospitals. If you want to run a hospital or to buy medical equipment, you have to get the government's permission through one of these certificate of need laws. The island of Maui, the island of Maui has about a population of something like 15,000, right? And until a few years ago, there was only one hospital on the island of Maui. It's kind of on the northwest corner of the island, sort of. And that meant that if you were harmed in, say, a boating accident on the southeastern part of the island, you would have to endure a two-hour ambulance ride on the two, only two-lane highway that connects you to the hospital. And if any of you have been to Hawaii, you know what it's like when those highways get jammed by, say, a car accident. You might as well get out of your car, right? So somebody decided, hey, why don't we start up our own hospital? And some private investor, investors got together and they were going to start up their own hospital and the state of Hawaii denied them a certificate of need to open a new hospital because they would compete against the existing state-owned hospital. Now I'm glad to say some, some years later they granted that certificate and there is now a second hospital there. But during that interim, there is somebody who needed to make it to the emergency room and didn't because of these laws. When I was talking about my freedom, you were probably thinking, why is this guy getting all worked up about moving licenses? You know, this is a moving license. Running a moving company is this guy's American dream. And who are we to look down upon it? Who are we to say, well, economic freedom doesn't matter so much. Freedom of speech, that's really important. But economic freedom, you know. Religious freedom, that's really important. But property rights, well, you know. And yet that is the law that we live with today as a result of the New Deal revolution that so transformed American law that the government now is free to choose winners and losers in the economy virtually with impunity. That should change. Every American has the right to earn a living without unreasonable government interference, and it's high time for the courts to protect that right. So when I win my lawsuits in Kentucky and Nevada, as I expect to do, (laughs) I look forward to a day when everybody can run a business, go into a business for themselves without getting government permission or getting the permission from their own competitors, where people can put their skills to use at their trade instead of at politics. That's what I have to say to you tonight, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Oh, the microphone, yeah. Does anybody have a question? Okay, over the other side. So if you're leaving for a class, please do so quietly. Hello? Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, you can? Okay. Yep. <laughs> Um, one, one question I did have is, uh, who regulates and monitors if someone uh, were to operate outside of their license limits, yeah, like, so for example, who, Missouri? Who, who is it that monitors whether people operate without their licenses? The answer is really the other moving companies, right? Because they're the ones who have a vested interest in preventing competition. So what happens is the other moving companies watch, and then they call the police when they discover that somebody is doing this. And the result is that existing businesses invest their time and money in in an in inefficient thing. What they're doing is the existing companies are investing their time and energies in policing the law instead of improving customer service. That's the inefficiency that's caused by these kinds of licensing laws. If a, if a barrier to entry creates a huge profit for the existing companies, those companies are going to use their time and money not in improving service, but in policing that boundary, right? Which is why we shouldn't have those boundaries in the first place. Yes? Uh, they legally they legally form a company 
and they start becoming a monopoly, not with government help, but through competition, they become a monopoly. Uh, is that what? <laughs> My, well, I have two answers to that. The first one is that we specifically asked the government whether they, were, they believed that these laws were used to prevent monopoly, and they said no. That, of course, under the rational basis test, that's not binding. The court could still rule against us on that basis. But on a broader, on a broader more theoretical basis, my answer is, in a free economy, that will not happen. In a free economy in which consumers and producers get to choose amongst themselves without government intervention, the only way that a moving company would come to dominate a large part of the market share is if it satisfies customers and lowers its prices, or provides some sort of tailored service that people are willing to pay more for, or something like that. And that's a good thing. I think it's very unfortunate that because of the irrationality of our antitrust regime in this country, successful businesses that are successful because they're good get persecuted simply because they're successful and prosperous. An example of this, fortunately, that's, we've kind of backed away, at least at the federal level, we've backed away from that kind of irrational antitrust policy largely thanks to the Chicago School of Antitrust Law led by the late Robert Bork, and the, uh, which said that the real interest should be protecting consumers, not protecting existing companies. And if you really take that to heart, most of your antitrust law is going to go away. So, for example, predatory pricing law. Predatory pricing law says we're going to make it illegal for people to cut their prices really low, for businesses to cut their prices really low, because what will happen is if they cut their prices really low, other companies can't compete, so then they'll go out of business. So then the person who's been cutting his prices real low, he can raise his prices and be a monopoly above the market level. Well, of course, such a scheme can only work if there are barriers to entry in the first place. If there are no barriers to entry, the, in the instant that the, that the alleged predator raises his prices again, I'm going to go into business to compete against him. I'm going to go into business to charge less than he is, and then I'll, I'll make my money back, right? So what the Supreme Court has said is predatory pricing lawsuits are not allowed to go forward unless the plaintiff can show that there is some way that the alleged predator could recoup the losses that are incurred through such a predatory scheme. And, in, and as a result, you just don't see these kinds of lawsuits anymore because predatory pricing is basically a myth. Yes? So the, the question is, do I think that self-regulation could work as, for example, uh, an alternative to, to regulation by, by the state? I do think that, ideally, the government would not be in the business of ensuring that movers are safe. I think consumers should do that. And in fact, I think in practice, most of the time, consumers do do that. I don't think people really do rely on government to, to, to ensure quality or consumer safety. I think what they, what they rely on is the Yelp ratings or Amazon ratings or word of mouth from other consumers. So, I'm sorry? Yeah, which violates your First Amendment rights. So, because ever, businesses should have the right to express themselves. But as part of this overall assault on the constitutional rights of business owners, the court has backed away from protecting free speech rights of businesses also and allow the government to silence excuse me, silence businesses. For example, there was a case that the Supreme Court just refused to take last week called Spirit Airlines. In that case, the Federal Aviation Administration said that airlines are not allowed, when they show you the price of an airline ticket, they're not allowed to say, that'll be $100 for the plane ticket and $20 in taxes. Not allowed to do that. They're only allowed to say it'll cost $120. Of course, Southwest Airlines and other, and other discount airlines like to point out that a huge portion of the price of an airline ticket is a government tax. This is a form of political speech. To, to be able to say, you know what, a lot of this price is caused by the government, it shouldn't be that way, is protected by the First Amendment. But the Supreme Court allowed the, the lower court decision to stand, which said the government can prohibit the airlines from doing that. 
But to get back to your earlier question in a more theoretical sense, I would say when it comes to regulating for safety, I think industry is a much better guarantor of consumer safety than government is for the reason I articulated earlier, which is that the government gets paid even if they get it wrong. That alone is a reason to trust the people on their own to do these jobs. They won't get it perfect, but of course neither will the government. And if they get it wrong, you can fire them. If the government gets it wrong, you can't fire them, right? When Enron went belly up, people lost their jobs, people lost their money, people went to jail. When the SEC was supposed to oversee Enron to make sure things like that didn't happen, nobody loses it, nobody gets punished, right? So I think that consumer safety is a service like any other service. And that service can be provided more efficiently, I think, by the private sector. For example, consumer reports and other rating systems that people do, in fact, and rightly, trust more than they trust government certification. Yes? Um, well, living here in the area under the age of 30, I'm that one libertarian, fiscally conservative friend amongst my huge group of liberal friends. So I'm just wondering, you're just so much smarter and well-spoken I am, yes. than I am. Yes, I am. Um, <laughs> what would you say, and you bring up the, you brought up the Uber case, and I've also been following the Uber case, and there's also Sidecar and Lyft, right. they're all operating in San right. Francisco. What would you say to all my San Francisco friends who exclusively use Uber because <laughs> it's such a great service, but they also exclusively vote for the people that want to put right. Uber out of business? I probably wouldn't say anything to them, but... <laughs> But well, they, know, they know who I here's, am, so they Here's the bottom it. line for me. For me, the bottom line is, and I, I, what I say to my liberal friends on these issues is, let's assume you're right. Let's assume that corporations are evil, right? And no doubt there are evil corporations. There was the aforementioned Enron, for example. Um, there's the Bin Laden Corporation. There's lots of really nasty corporations out there, right? Um, why would you trust government more than a corporation? Where... With a corporation, you can at least you can fire it, you can refuse to pay it, you can sue it, you can go with some other corporation, you don't like Taco Bell, you can go to Del Taco or whatever, right? With the government, you can't fire it, you can't refuse to pay it, you can't move somewhere else, you can't sue it most of the time, unless you've got a great lawyer like me, right? You can't, you don't have that kind of choice. The government can come and bang on your door in the middle of the night and drag you out of your house at gunpoint. Corporation, would you trust that power with a corporation? It, would you say, oh, you know, the Pepsi Corporation should be allowed to tell me whether I can go into business uh, as a mover or, or, or so? Of course you wouldn't, right? So why would you ever trust government when it has no incentive to get it right and sometimes the incentives to get it wrong, right? I, a while ago, some years ago, actually, it was, I remember, it was 1993 was the first time I ever went to a Starbucks. I was in Seattle with a friend, and she said, you've got to try this place. It's going to take the world by storm. So I went in there and... I was like, yeah, right, you know, overpriced, bitter coffee. And at, if you had had to prove in 1993 that the America needed a new chain of overpriced, bitter coffee shops, you couldn't have proven that, right? America had plenty of coffee shops in, at the time. And yet it turns out that America did need a new chain of coffee shops. How do we know? Because Starbucks is so successful. There's no way to anticipate what consumers actually want because it's constantly changing, right? I'm old enough to remember New Coke. Remember New Coke? The, the marketing geniuses at the Coca-Cola Corporation decided that what America really wanted was a change in the recipe for Coca-Cola to make it taste different. And they did this whole huge rollout and everything, and it was a flop. It was a huge flop. It was a mega flop. It was such a flop that New Coke became a byword for getting it wrong, right? And those were the Coca-Cola Corporation's marketing geniuses, the best trained people in the world. And they had a huge incentive to get it right. The Missouri Department of Transportation Motor Carrier Services Division? They don't do any consumer research to decide whether there needs to be a new moving company. And even if they did, they have no reason to get it right because they get paid even if they get it wrong. They have no incentive to get it right and they don't have the tools. They cannot have the tools to get it right. What Hayek pointed out was that they can't gather the kind of information or make use of the kind of information necessary to run an industry. And, you know, somebody mentioned, oh, the, we live in an increasingly complicated society today. 
you know, as a fellow outcast libertarian, I'm sure you can sympathize that you constantly hear from people, oh, well, your ideas about free markets were great in an 18th century world when everybody lived on farms. And nowadays, everything is so much more complicated that we have to have government, you know, to, to oversee us and everything like that. Which, of course, is logically completely backwards. It's precisely the fact that we live in such a complicated society that is why the government cannot do this job. Why, why the government cannot plan out the economics, decide who, what services to, and, and products to provide. And so, like the healthcare industry. The healthcare industry is v vastly more complicated than anybody in this room can possibly understand. And what we're now doing is we have this 3,000 page Obamacare law that mostly consists of saying the Secretary of Health and Human Services will decide in the future what to do about such and such. So most of it's a blank check to begin with. And then we're going to get thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of federal regulations laying out what kind of operations can be performed and when and how much is... I mean, we already have the, a lot of this already. The Code of Federal Regulations in this country already dictates everything from the thickness of ketchup in ketchup packets to the angle at which these chairs can lean back. And yet, and we, we cannot have a, a central authority that deter, makes these kinds of determinations and runs an ideal society. Those decisions can only be made through the complicated, decentralized market process of discovery and experimentation. You couldn't decide whether Starbucks was necessary in 1993. The only way to decide it was to experiment, try it. And you can't try it under laws like this. It makes it illegal to try it. That's what's the problem with that. So that's what you should tell all of your uh, all of your liberal friends. I'm sure you memorized all of that. And, um, well, and, and luckily, they, uh, judging by their reaction to the lawsuit, they, their eyes literally started to open. <laughs> well, you know, and actually, that's right. A, a lot of the time, our liberal friends are very sympathetic to cases like this. And you know, g people who are in good faith, liberals in good faith, care about the little guy. That's what they're concerned with. They're saying, look. What we have is a society in which the poor ha find it at least unfairly hard to rise out of their station in life, right? At the very least, it's very difficult for them to do so, and it should be easier for them to do so. And they are right about that. The problem is that they have blinders when it comes to how government operates. They think that you can create a government institution to rectify that problem that will not fall prey to the self-interest of the public choice problem. They think that even if you can get past all that knowledge stuff, that, okay, well, society can be wisely governed by the right people. And what public choice theory shows us is it doesn't make any difference who the people are. No matter how well-intentioned your wealth redistribution program is, it's going to fall into the hands of the people who are the most politically adept and not into the hands of the most morally deserving. Take eminent domain abuse, for example, right? Costco, the nation's leading abuser of eminent domain, the reason why they bring you such low, low prices is because they don't pay for their real estate, right? They use eminent domain. They go to city council and say, hey, city council, why don't you condemn this property and give it to us and we'll build a Costco there. And then you can say you've created jobs and we'll say that we've built this beautiful Costco and the poor people who live there, you know, whatever, they'll move to some other city which will raise the average income of your city and then you'll look good for that too, right? It ain't rich white guys having their houses taken through eminent domain to give to Costco. Why? Because rich white guys can get the political machine to do what they want. The poor, the members of racial minorities, people in the inner city, immigrants, those are the people who don't have that political influence. And so that's why they need to be protected against private industries using the government for, its own, for their own welfare. So liberals who care about the poor ought to be sympathetic to this situation and ought to see that when government is in the, in, in the position of redistributing wealth, that power is going to fall into the hands of precisely the evil, greedy corporations they dislike because the evil, greedy corporations know how to game the system and always will. You cannot design a system that will not turn into that. Yes? A question over there, but I'm going to follow up on this one really quick because it takes two to tango. And what I think he always hears and what I always hear is only one half of that dance, the evil, greedy corporation. Right. Uh, how do we get people to recognize that they've got a dance partner in terms of an EV, evil, greedy political uh, structure that's willing to play that game the, the way and, that you, and to win from it also? There's only one way to, do, to, to convince people of that, 
and that is to donate to the Pacific Legal Foundation <laughs> so, that we continue, so that we can continue to bring cases like this and speak to them to groups like this and convince people of the error of their ways. Really, there is no answer to that except to try and talk to our fellow citizens. You know, and I know that that's frustrating. I remember when I was in college, I hated it when people would say, the solution to this problem is education because it sounds so lame. But you know what? The solution to this problem really is education. You cannot create a perfect system. You can only create a system that's as good as the people who staff it. And this reminds me of an incident that occurred at the Richmond Ratification Convention when the Constitution was being debated. Patrick Henry got up and he was opposed to the Constitution. And he said, you know, you can't ratify this Constitution because if you ratify this Constitution, Congress is going to do all sorts of terrible things to us. They're going to, for example, force us to buy health insurance against our will. Right? And he went on and on like this. And James Madison got up and he said, okay, look, you don't have to worry about that because of this and that and the checks and balances and the Bill of Rights and all this stuff. And then he said, but in the end, he said, do we then have no virtue among us? For if not, we are indeed in a wretched situation. No parchment boundaries can ever protect us then. No government is good enough to resist the people themselves. And if the people don't care about the right to earn a living, we won't have constitutional protection for the right to earn a living. Somebody else? Yes? So what happens when the right to earn a living does in fact conflict with public welfare? So there is a 24-year-old grad student in Texas who is using 3D printers to print parts of firearms. Mm -hmm. He is then distributing the files that he creates on his computer onto websites that are public access right. so that anybody with a 3D printer can then use these files to create firearms. Right, right. So I guess my question is your thoughts on that. Yeah. So in my ideal world, I would, I would not have the government policing public safety, but I recognize that, that I don't understand the theory well enough to make that kind of an argument in court, and I would lose anyway. So the compromise position that I take, and you can always judge a person by the second best position that they endorse, right? The person's ideal position doesn't tell you anything about their views. What tells you about their actual beliefs is what is the second best that they're willing to accept. And the second best that I'm willing to accept is to say, if a person does present a danger to the public health and safety, that person should be stopped. I think that selling gun parts is probably perfectly okay. We sell, you know, guns can be sold and so forth. Um, and I don't have an objection to that. But you can think of many other examples of where a person would be a danger to the public safety. And I think when a person is a danger to the public safety, yes, the government has a role to step in and prevent people from doing that. Um, and, you know, there are, and there are, like in the moving industry, the fit, willing, and able provision of the test, tested whether a person, you know, uh, is going to run over people when he's driving a moving truck or something like that. And I have no objection to that. I think, you know, insofar as government can do that, which I don't think they really can do a very good job of it, but if they want to do that, I see no violation of individual rights in doing so. Yes? Hi. Can you talk about uh, your views on the current patent and copyright system? Pa oh, my views? Uh, good question. Um, I think I'm generally opposed to the idea of intellectual property. Um, I think that one of, the, one of the problems is some people, especially libertarians, or some groups of libertarians, and this is a conflict within the libertarian community, but some groups of libertarians seem to think that patents are a kind of natural right, that I've created this thing and therefore nobody should have the right to take this thing from me and that that's what patents are about, and they're not. They're not. Patents are monopolies that are given to people by the government as an incentive for them to improve and create and so forth. And the problem comes when those then infringe on the liberty of people who want to earn a living in some other way. So I'll give you a great example. My mother invented a paintbrush about, oh gosh, almost 30 years ago. My mother came up with this idea for a paintbrush. We were painting a house, and she said, you know, it's very annoying that I have to go and get a, a um, screwdriver to open up the paint can and then get the paintbrush. Why don't they make a paintbrush where the end of the handle flattens out into something like a screwdriver, and then you can pry open the paint can lid with one end, and that's a great idea, right? She didn't steal it from anybody. She thought of it entirely herself. Well, it turns out that it's been patented in fact, it's been patented three times, different kinds of designs, which means that if she were to go into business making and selling her paintbrush thing, she could be sued for triple damages for doing so. She hasn't infringed on anybody's rights. And at least according to libertarian theory, you never have a right to initiate force against a person who has not initiated force against you. 
You have no right to go out and punch somebody in the face. You have no right to make their businesses illegal just so you can profit. You have no right to silence people and so forth. And for the same reason, you should have no right to get the government to prohibit my mother from making and selling her paintbrush. And I don't think you can come up with an intellectual property scheme that avoids that problem. So in that, for that reason and for a couple other reasons, another, another problem is um, where do you draw the lines, right? Um, especially in copyright. Drawing lines for derivative works, for example. And, I mean, the, of course, take, let's take a great a, a, an example. The greatest rock and roll musician in all of history, John Fogarty of Creedence Clearwater Revival, <laughs> who invented a genre of, of music that we today call swamp rock, it's in, primarily in Creedence's classic 1968 album, Bayou Country, which begins with the song ba- Born on the Bayou. Right? Now, that, there's a very distinctive sound to that kind of music, which is why it's called swamp rock. You know? Now, there are, other kind, there are other musicians who produce swamp rock. The Foo Fighters have some songs that, that you could say. Stevie Ray Vaughan sort of has a little bit of that sound. Um, probably the most obvious example is the Hollies classic, Long Cool Woman in a Black Dress, which um, so many people mistook for Creedence songs that Fogarty said it was the best song he never wrote. Right? Now, does Fogarty have a claim against them? It's a completely different song. They didn't rip off the tune. They didn't rip off the words. It just sort of sounds like him, so much so that a lot of people think he wrote the song, right? Where do you draw that kind of a line? My answer is the government shouldn't be in the business of drawing these lines. You have the right to compete, which means that if I see that somebody has opened a a, a gas station on the street corner and is making good money at it, I can think, hey, I should open a gas station on that street corner, right? That's what the entire free enterprise system is based on. And yet in the realm of intellectual property, if John Fogarty produces a song, and I'm like, hey, I should do a song like that. I'm not allowed to. And, and the examples of this kind of abuse are rife. The most, the most heinous example is, um, I think it was two years ago, the Australian rock group Men at Work was successfully sued by the owners of the copyright of Kookaburra Sits in the Old Gum Tree. Now, if you know the song, Kookaburra Sits in the Old Gum Tree, goes, Kookaburra Sits in the Old Gum Tree, right? And that phrase is quoted in Men at Work's classic 1980s hit, Down Under. And as a result, the owners of the copyright to Kookaburra Sits in the Old Gum Tree were able to sue and get damages from Men at Work. Now, there's nobody in the entire world who ever wants to listen to Kookaburra Sits in the Old Gum Tree and is satisfied by instead listening to Men at Work's Down Under, right? Nevertheless, the intellectual property laws allow that kind of thing, right? I should have said, there's nobody who ever wants to listen to Kookaburra Sits in the Old Gum Tree. Um, But that's why I have problems with intellectual property rights. Intellectual property rights are a kind of subsidy created by the government that tie our hands and prevent us from competing in order to benefit those who were lucky enough to get to the patent office first. Yes? Does that apply to um, uh, drug companies and where they spend hundreds of millions of dollars developing a drug? um, Shouldn't there be some way for them to recoup that cost without somebody... So that's the other pro- other side of the coin, right? And that is that these are, they're, at least it seems that these patents operate as a very effective incentive for innovation and creativity. And the, and the drug companies in particular, they say, well, if, if we couldn't enjoy the profits from our patents, then we wouldn't spend the time and energy that it takes to come up with these drugs because other people could then come in at the last minute and rip us off and sell these generic brands and we wouldn't make our money back. And it's very time-consuming and expensive to produce these drugs. I acknowledge that that is a reasonable argument. I, just, I think that the problem is when that conflicts with the the individual liberty interests at stake with patents and copyrights, I shy away from it, and I, I don't find it convincing. Um, incidentally, I don't know if you've been following this, but there is a case now in front of the Supreme Court, it was argued just the other day, um, about whether you can patent genes in human DNA. And it's a very interesting case. It is going to be a huge... This, this entire Supreme Court term, actually, is going to be a blockbuster. There are going to be enormously controversial cases being decided in June, so keep your eyes open for that. Yes? Thank you for coming. Welcome to the Rock at the Barstool Gathering at Flames. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody.